You're looking at the heart of a fossil fuel plant, the boiler. Often several stories high, boilers look so awesome they seem indestructible, but they're not. <laughs> Like all machinery, boilers require maintenance. And that's what I'm going to talk about. The trouble spots to watch for, ways to maintain a boiler at its highest efficiency, and how to make sure its components don't fail. To some extent, the problems affecting a boiler's efficiency and function are determined by what kind of boiler your plant uses. All boilers have some things in common. They all contain hot gases created by burning fuel. All boilers heat water to produce steam, and all boilers require maintenance. Not all boilers, though, are constructed the same way. The many different types can be separated into two basic categories. The fire tube boiler on the left, and the water tube boiler on the right. As these names indicate, there's a difference in what the two types of boilers have in their tubes as well as in the unit's basic construction. Fire tube boilers, which are sometimes used for heating, pass hot gases from combustion through tubes surrounded by water. The hot gases heat the water around the tubes, producing steam. In water tube boilers, the locations of water and gases are reversed. Here, water flows through the tubes. Hot gases surrounding the tubes heat the water to produce steam. Each type of boiler produces steam differently. Fire tube boilers produce steam by operating at low pressure with large volumes of water in the boiler. This allows for more stable operation. Water tube boilers, on the other hand, have less water and are more responsive to changing steam demands. In addition, they are capable of producing the high pressure, high temperature steam needed for efficient operation. Well, since it's the water tube boiler that you're most likely to see at your plant, let's take a closer look at it and see what its potential maintenance problems are likely to be. There are two types of water tube boilers, the drum type and the once through type. Here you see simplified drawings of each type. Most of the interconnecting tubes have been left out so that you'll be able to see the major components more clearly. The drum type boiler has a large cylinder or drum where many of the boiler tubes are attached. Drum type boilers are recirculating boilers. Water that is not converted to steam on its first pass through the boiler continues to flow within it. Once through type boilers are not recirculating types, so they convert water to steam in one pass. Once through boilers do not have a drum. Instead, they have a moisture separator or flash tank. When necessary, the moisture separator or flash tank removes any water that is not converted to steam during its first pass. All boilers have slightly different water and steam flow paths because their designs are different. We'll look at a typical example, but each plant will have different kinds of boilers with different flow paths. In this water tube drum type boiler, water enters the boiler and goes to the economizer where it is preheated. From there, it flows into the drum. The water then circulates down through the downcomers and into the water walls. The water walls completely line the furnace, which is where the fuel is burned. As the water rises through the water wall tubes, it is heated to produce steam. It then returns to the drum. In the drum, water is separated from the steam produced in the water walls. This steam goes to the superheaters, which raise its temperature. The water that has been separated from the steam flows back through the downcomers for another pass through the water walls. The rest of the path is for the steam. In this example, the boiler also has a reheater. Here, steam is heated again because its temperature and pressure drop during plant use. Once the steam is reheated, it flows back into the plant. The water and steam flow paths in both a drum type boiler and once through boiler are basically the same. However, in a once through type boiler, there is no drum. Instead, the moisture separator or flash tank 
separates water from steam in the water's first pass through the boiler. Water is not recirculated the way it is in a drum-type boiler. To sum up, the water and steam flow path in a drum-type water tube boiler look like this. Water goes to the economizer, then into the drum. From there, it flows down the downcomers and into the water walls, where it is heated by hot gas from burning fuel. As the water flows up the water wall tubes, it's converted to steam. The steam flows through the superheaters and out into the plant. In this example, the steam comes back to the reheater, where its temperature is raised before it goes back into the plant. That covers the water and steam flow path, but we still need to see the hot gas flow path. A lot of the heat created by burning fuel is carried by the hot gases that result when fuel burns. In order to use this heat, the boiler is built so that hot gas flows through its various components and contacts the tubes. When fuel enters the furnace, it is mixed with air and ignited. This burning in the furnace forms a high temperature gas. The gas flows past the water walls and through the superheaters and economizer. The gas will flow on to other components, but these are outside of the boiler. Despite the fact that both types of boilers are water tube boilers, there are some differences between them. For example, once through boilers usually operate under much higher pressure than drum types. They also have higher temperatures and use higher flow rates that require thicker tubes. Because of these high pressures, temperatures, and flow rates, once through boiler problems are potentially more damaging. However, both types of water tube boilers have three basic kinds of problems. Improper gas flow, improper water flow, and tube failure. Improper gas flow and improper water flow result in decreased boiler efficiency and eventual tube failure. Tube failure from any cause can lead to an outage or plant shutdown. A single day's lost production due to plant shutdown is worth about $300,000. This is a typical daily cost of having a large boiler shut down. But for you, the boiler maintenance person. Fixing a failed tube can be a hard, time-consuming job. As for improper gas flow and improper water flow, both can be equally costly if allowed to go unchecked. Well, let's look at these kinds of problems a little more closely. In a water tube boiler, the water in the tubes is exposed to heat. This heat either comes directly from a fire or is carried by hot gases caused by fire. The boiler is constructed to provide maximum exposure to this heat. However, if the tubes become blocked so that heat cannot reach them, the tubes can't function. This decreases the boiler's efficiency by changing the gas flow. And this change can lead to tube erosion and failure. Remember, the free flow of gas is essential to the operation of your boiler. But gas is not the only flow factor you need to watch. The water flow must also be watched because a reduction of water flow can cause overheating and failure of the boiler tubes. Water or steam that is being heated in the tubes also cools the tube metal. When any tube does not receive its proper cooling flow, the tube metal becomes so hot that it fails. When that happens, the pressure in the tube will blow a hole in it. And then you're looking at a major problem. Well, while water flow is critical in any kind of boiler, it is especially critical in a once-through. Once-through water tube boilers are more sensitive to changes in water flow. This makes tube failures in a once-through even more likely than in a drum type. Well, so far, We've discussed problems connected with water flow and hot gas flow through a boiler. And we've touched on how the hot gases are used in the boiler system. What we haven't spoken about is the heat source and problems associated with it. That source is the burning of fuel. There are three common fossil fuels used for boiler firing. Natural gas, 
oil and coal. Natural gas for steam plants is in very short supply right now. As a result, boilers burning natural gas are much less common than those using oil or coal. This is unfortunate because natural gas is the cleanest of these three common fuels and causes practically no maintenance problems. The major maintenance problem associated with oil is soot accumulations. A typical plant burns 3,000 tons, or about 2,725 metric tons of oil per day, which produces 24 tons, or 21.8 metric tons, of soot per day. Although oil is not as clean as natural gas, it's a lot cleaner than coal. Coal is the cheapest and most available fossil fuel, but it poses the most significant maintenance problems. These come primarily from the ash produced when coal burns. An average sized plant burning 4,320 tons or 3,925 metric tons of coal per day produces 562 tons or 511 metric tons of ash per day. Now, this ash can cause tube blockage which decreases boiler efficiency. A coal fired boiler encounters two types of ash bottom ash and fly ash. Bottom ash is made up of heavy particles that fall to the bottom of the furnace in the boiler as combustion takes place. Bottom ash also includes molten ash. This forms on the boiler's furnace walls and runs down to the bottom of the boiler. Bottom ash is any ash on the bottom of the furnace in the ash hopper. Bottom ash poses two major problems. One is that it can build up on the boiler furnace walls, reducing heat transfer to the boiler tubes. And secondly, large chunks of ash, called clinkers, can drop through the furnace and damage the boiler's internal components when they land. Now, fly ash is different from bottom ash. It is made up of light ash particles that look like gray talcum powder. These particles are carried through the boiler in the gas flow. Fly ash also causes two major problems. First, it is an abrasive that can cause wear in the boiler tubes. In fact, the wear effect on the tubes is similar to what sandblasting would do. The fly ash is continually wearing down the boiler tubes whenever the boiler is in operation. Now the second problem is that fly ash can collect on or around the boiler tubes. When enough fly ash accumulates, it prevents the free flow of gases through the boiler. Fly ash accumulation can make the abrasion problem worse. Since there's now a smaller area through which gases can flow, the gases will flow faster, causing the fly ash particles to hit the tubes harder. Before going further, let's review what we've covered. There are two common types of boilers, fire tube and water tube. They differ in construction and, in, and uh, in what is carried in their tubes. Water tube types are the most common and are either drum type or once through. Both types produce steam and both have three major maintenance problems. Improper water flow, improper gas flow, and tube failure. All boilers need fuel to operate. There are three common types of fossil fuel, natural gas, oil, and coal. Coal is the most common, but produces two kinds of ash that can cause maintenance problems if they are not carefully watched. Well, let's stop for a few minutes. If you have any questions, clear them up now with your instructor. We're going to be spending a lot of time working on boilers, so let's look at some boiler parts and some of their typical problems. First, we'll examine a coal-fired water tube boiler's furnace. Remember, though, that most of the problems we'll talk about are common to all kinds of boilers. Our first area of concern is the water walls. 
Water walls are made of tubes which completely line the inside of the furnace and surround its fire. It's in these tubes that the water is converted to steam. Because the water walls are located close to the fire, the water walls are subject to overheating. Overheating at the water walls can happen in several ways. The coal-fired water tube boiler is built for combustion to take place in the lower portion of the furnace. Overheating can happen if there is misalignment of the burners. When burners are misaligned, their flame is directed against the water wall rather than toward the center of the furnace. This leads to fuel erosion, which is the tube wear caused by the fuel. A related problem is flame impingement. Flame impingement occurs when combustion takes place at the surface of the water wall tubes instead of in the center of the furnace. This direct contact can cause a section of the water wall to overheat. If the overheating lasts long enough, the tube will fail and eventually rupture, causing a severe leak. Tube ruptures and leaks in general are common water wall maintenance problems. Besides tube wear caused by flame impingement, tube ruptures and leaks can result from clinker impact, corrosion, overheating due to waterside scale formation, erosion, and other factors. And some of these terms are new to you and we'll cover them in a little while. Well, what's important to know right now is that leaks are often the result of a combination of problems. What's more, the leaks can occur anywhere in the water wall. The most common locations of water wall leaks are those areas closest to the fire and in the headers. Headers are pipes that have a number of tubes connected to them. Each connection is a good spot to look for a leak. Besides leakage, there are problems with soot and ash. Ash or soot accumulates on the water wall during normal furnace operation. It is periodically removed from the tubes by soot blowers. Soot blowers are devices that use compressed air or steam to blow the soot or ash off the water wall tubes. In the water wall area, these devices are called wall blowers. Soot removal is usually an automatic process that is started by the plant operator. You get involved when the soot blowers do not function properly. Wall blowers work by extending themselves a short way into the boiler. There, they rotate and blow a stream of compressed air over the tubes to remove the accumulated ash. Wall blower maintenance problems arise when they fail to insert or withdraw when they fail to rotate properly, when there is insufficient steam or compressed air supply pressure, or when the soot blower itself is not properly aligned. Improper soot blower alignment can be a big problem when the high pressure air or steam flow is directed against the tubes. It can severely erode them, producing leaks. Besides the openings for soot blowers, there are other openings in the water wall. These are called burner openings. Burner openings are located in the sides or corners of the boiler. Burner openings, like water wall tubes, are located close to the fire and so are exposed to a lot of heat. This heat can cause burner parts to warp, preventing proper burner operation. To combat this, burner openings are usually surrounded by heat-resistant material called refractory. A refractory is used to seal and insulate the areas around the burner openings. With this added protection, though, comes another maintenance worry. Because of the intense heat in the furnace, the refractory itself can deteriorate. Heat can cause more damage than just deteriorating the refractory. It can also melt accumulated ash, which could flow down the water wall. If molten ash were to flow over the burner openings, it could partially block them. Blockage would result in an unstable fire. Another opening in the water wall provides for inspection doors or observation ports. Inspection doors and observation ports are used by operators to inspect furnace walls and to monitor the fire. They should be closed when they're not being used. 
The causes of their problems are the same here as they were for burner openings. Intense heat causes the refractory to break down, while clinkers and ash cause blockage. A blocked inspect uh, inspection door cannot be used if you can't see through it. Inspection doors cannot be left open because hot gases or flames can escape from the boiler, possibly burning someone or starting an outside fire. Also, an open inspection door is an invitation to cold air. If drawn into the boiler, cold air will reduce efficiency. Well, the last furnace component we'll discuss right now is the ash hopper. The ash hopper is located at the bottom of the furnace. It collects the ash not carried away in the gas flow. When the boiler is working correctly, ash falls through an opening in the bottom of the furnace and into a tank of water, where it is cooled or quenched. Ash is flushed out with water jets. The accumulated ash is carried out by the water, and the tank is then refilled. Removing the ash from the water tank is called pulling the bottom ash. Although the ash hopper process sounds simple, the ash hopper area and the water wall tubes right above it can prove to be real maintenance problems. Well, clinkers often fall from higher up in the boiler, bounce off the water wall tubes, and into the ash hopper. This causes damage to both the water wall tubes and the refractory. More trouble occurs when the clinkers are too large to go through the opening and into the ash hopper. When that happens, the clinker blocks the ash from entering the ash hopper. More ash then piles on top of the clinker, and the blockage gets worse. Eventually, the ash hopper is completely blocked. Bottom ash then starts to fill up in the furnace, and the boiler has to be shut down. Long before that final stage, you should have cleared the blockage. But even then, your troubles might not be over. If you get the clinkers into the ash hopper, small ones can be handled easily. Big ones, though, will have to be broken up before they're pulled out of the hopper. Clinkers can cause still another problem. Ash hoppers sometimes contain spray nozzles to help move ash out when the bottom ash is pulled. They're a big help when they work, but they can be knocked out by falling clinkers. So. Remember to periodically check the spray nozzles for damage. Damage can also occur in the ash hopper's refractory, which is its insulation. Ash hoppers are usually made of steel plate lined with refractory. The refractory is constantly exposed to hot clinkers and cold water. During a year's operation, the ash hopper is drained and refilled many times. And the heat, cold, and moisture break down the refractory. It must then be repaired. Well, you've uh, been inside the furnace, you've seen its parts, and studied its problems. Take some time now and work any problems you might have out. We've examined components in the furnace, so now let's move along following the hot gas as it flows through the boiler. As we go, we'll study the components in the hot gas flow and their maintenance problems. To do this, we'll be looking at a coal-fired water tube boiler. But remember, the maintenance problems we'll be talking about can occur in all kinds of boilers. As hot gases from a combustion situation leave the furnace, the first component they meet is a superheater. Superheaters are usually grouped by their location in the boiler. A boiler can have all four groups or any combination. The four groups are platen, pendant, horizontal, and radiant superheaters. Radiant superheaters are built into the top of the water wall. They are positioned in a direct line of sight to the furnace fire so they get heat from radiant energy. A radiant superheater has many of the same problems that occur in water walls, including leaks and ash deposits. In the platen superheater, ash deposits can also be a problem. 
The platen superheater is located in the same boiler area as the radiant superheater, but it is suspended over the furnace. The tubes in the platen superheater are widely separated to prevent bridging. Now, bridging is what occurs when ash accumulates and bridges the gap between the tubes. In the pendant or hanging superheater, the tubes also extend across the gas flow path. Pendant superheaters are also subject to deposits, tube failure, and ash. Since pendant superheaters are located in the direct path of the hot gases, they are more likely to be damaged from erosion caused by their flow. Another problem with pendant superheaters comes from their construction. Basically, a pendant superheater is a bundle of tubes hung from the top of the boiler. To keep these tubes at a proper distance from each other, spacers are used. Now, two kinds of spacers may be used to hold the tubes apart, tie bars and water-cooled spacers. Water-cooled spacers have water from the water walls running through them for cooling. Tie bars and spacers ensure that the tubes will hang straight up and down. Sometimes these spacers come loose, and when the spacers loosen, the tubes may vibrate while the boiler is operating, and this vibrating leads to metal fatigue at the place where the tubes connect, called header mounts. It also may cause damage if the tubes bang into one another. In the pendant type arrangement, the tubes are set up so they pass vertically across the gas flow several times. Now, this way, the steam in the tubes is exposed to the hot gases longer, providing a better chance for the tubes to absorb heat. Superheaters can also be built with their tubes running horizontally. Whether your plant's boiler uses the vertical or horizontal type depends on the boiler design. Often, boilers have both horizontal and vertical tube arrangements placed in a number of locations throughout the path of hot gas. Larger boilers might have several sections of the different kinds of superheaters. Regardless of their tube arrangements, all superheaters have an ash accumulation problem. Usually, there is some provision for removing it, like some type of soot blower. To remove ash from superheaters, soot blowers must be able to reach clear across the boiler. Now, this can be accomplished two different ways. One way is to have a retractable soot blower lance tube-like blowing element inserted into the boiler when blowing is required, and then retracted. The second way is to permanently install the soot blower inside the boiler. The air or steam supply is turned on whenever blowing is required. Both kinds of soot blowers have potential boiler maintenance problems. The retractable soot blower must be properly lined up in order to correctly enter the superheater. If it is misaligned and comes too close to the tubes, well, tubes could be eroded by the air or steam used in the blowing. Now, another problem is that sometimes retractable soot blowers fail to fully retract. The part of the blowing lance left in the boiler can then be damaged by the heat. Heat is also a factor with permanently installed soot blowers. They may warp because they're exposed to heat all the time. Permanently installed soot blowers are subject to erosion from fly ash. If erosion or warping from heat exposure alters the alignment of the nozzles that direct the steam or airflow, ash won't be removed from the tubes. Misalignment can also cause the nozzles to blow directly on the tubes. This can cause tube erosion. Now that we've covered superheaters and their related components, we have the gas flow's third encounter, baffles. Baffles are plates and vanes used to direct the flow of hot gases through the boiler. The warping and erosion of baffles can break them loose from their supports. This turns the baffles into projectiles that can cause extensive damage within the boiler. Warped or eroded baffles must be repaired or replaced before they cause severe problems. Moving with the flow, the next component we meet is the reheater. 
Now this consists of a row of superheater elements arranged across the hot gas flow path. There can be several reheater sections in a boiler. The reheater's construction is a lot like the pendant superheater, and it is prone to many of the same maintenance problems. Finally, we come to the economizer. Like superheaters and reheaters, the economizer consists of a row of heater elements arranged across the hot gas flow path. The difference in the economizer is in its construction. Economizer tubes usually have some kind of surface extensions on their outsides to increase heat transfer. These extensions may run around the tube or along its length. Extensions which go around the tubes are called gill rings. Extensions which run the length of an economizer tube are called fins. Whenever you hear someone talking about finned tubes and gill rings, they're not talking about fish. What they're talking about is the extensions on the economizer tubes used to aid heat transfer. Economizers have some unique maintenance problems. The gas flow velocity and temperatures they are exposed to are generally less than those to which superheater is exposed. However, they frequently become corroded, which could lead to failure. When an economizer fails, it's a very serious problem because all the water entering the boiler must first pass through the economizer. If water cannot pass through the economizer and into the rest of the boiler, the entire boiler can be damaged. To a lesser degree, economizers have some of the same types of problems as the superheater. But ash accumulation occurs to a greater degree in the economizer because the gas flows over the tubes at a slower speed, making it easier for ash to collect. Also, the extended surface of the economizer tubes provides a support for ash buildup, and this support intensifies the ash accumulation in the economizer. Another economizer problem is unconsumed coal or oil that sometimes gets mixed in with the ash or soot accumulations. When this happens, the combustible material can explode or catch fire, causing extensive boiler damage. Oil and coal contain sulfur that is burned during the natural combustion process. Corrosion caused by burning sulfur can really be damaging. And when sulfur burns, it produces sulfur oxides. Then, when sulfur oxides combine with water from condensation, they form acids. The economizer is the coolest component we've talked about. So, some moisture from condensation is likely to be around. Now, one of the acids formed is sulfuric acid, and it attacks tube surfaces in the economizer. Of the components we've discussed, the economizer is the most likely place for acid attack. But corrosion from sulfuric acid can occur anywhere in the boiler. As for the other components we've been talking about, radiant superheaters, pendant superheaters, horizontal superheaters, baffles, reheaters, and economizers, remember that each is individually important. And each has its own individual maintenance problems. Well, take some time now to clear up any questions you might have. The first thing you see when you look at the boiler from the outside is the boiler casing. The boiler casing is the covering outside the entire boiler. The casing steel plate is only the outer layer. Just inside this outer layer is a layer of refractory. In a typical boiler, the refractory layer varies in thickness from about six inches to one foot. The purpose of the casing is to contain the fire and hot gases within the boiler. When the boiler casing fails to contain fire and hot gases, it becomes a maintenance problem. Buckling of the casing is the failure you're most likely to encounter. A buckled casing may be caused by a hot spot on the boiler wall. Here, the section of boiler casing at a hot spot expands from the heat. 
Now, since the steel plate in surrounding areas will not give enough to allow for this expansion, the casing buckles, usually outward. This results in what looks like a big bulge in the casing. Well, this buckling pro uh, process can be violent uh, and the casing might rupture. If you have to fix the failed casing, you'd be wise to conduct an intensive search to find out what caused the hot spot in the first place, and then correct it so it doesn't happen again. Your inspection should also determine if the boiler suffered any internal damage. Repairing the outside does not correct anything on the inside. Heat expansion can cause casing failure in another way. The boiler expands when heated. A large boiler can expand by as much as a foot. Well, this is usually compensated for in the construction of the boiler by hanging the whole boiler from the top. Clearance is left at the bottom to allow for expansion. If, however, that expansion is interfered with, if the boiler clearance area is clogged in some way, the result will be buckling or breakage. When you repair a problem caused this way, be sure to clear out the cause of the original jam. Now, while we're talking about casing problems, let's consider an item that's outside the furnace and hot gas path, but inside the boiler casing. Most boilers have open areas at their top and bottom where the headers are located. Dead air spaces are located inside the casing, but have no air or gas moving through them. Dead air spaces are often areas where tube leaks can occur, especially where tubes are attached to the headers. Also, ash may accumulate in dead air spaces, and it must be removed during boiler shutdown. Ash removal gives you easy access to the headers for inspection or maintenance work. The next components we'll discuss are the downcomers. Downcomers are pipes, usually eight inches wide or larger, that run from the top of the boiler to the bottom. They provide a flow path for water circulation. The only trouble you're likely to find with the outside of the downcomers is corrosion. After the downcomers, the next component that might prove to be a maintenance problem is the boiler circulating pump. The boiler circulating pump is only found in some drum type boilers called controlled circulation boilers. Boilers without boiler circulating pumps are called natural circulation boilers. The seals on the pump are often a maintenance problem because they contain water under extremely high pressure and temperature. These conditions tend to cause leaks. Another set of components you should keep a sharp eye on are the vents and drains. Usually there is at least one vent at the top of a component and at least one drain at the bottom. Vents and drains are used to drain the boiler of water or to relieve pressure when the boiler is shut down. Vents and drains are attached at the headers, and headers tend to leak at the attachment welds. Another maintenance problem with vents and drains is rusting. Vent and drain piping is insulated. Water can accumulate inside the insulation and stay there for long periods of time. And if this occurs, the pipe metal can rust and ultimately fail. One other problem with vents and drains is blockage. Blockage usually occurs more frequently in the drains because this is how sludge and silt leave the boiler, but vents can also be blocked. The most common location for blockage in either vents or drains is at the valves in the vent or drain lines. Finally, these valves can leak during operation and cause a problem because they aren't containing boiler pressure. Well, all of these maintenance problems occur in components on the outside of the boiler. The boiler casing, dead air spaces, downcomers, boiler circulating pump, and vents and drains all require as much attention as do the boiler's internal components. You really have to be aware of every component and the specific hazards associated with them. Well, let's take some time now so you can clear up any questions you might have. Generally, you might think that once we had discussed the inside and the outside of a piece of equipment, there would be 
There's nothing left to talk about. Not true with your plant's boiler. It's time now to go over several water side components. Water side components are located inside where water is contained in the boiler. Again, we'll use a water tube coal-fired boiler as our example. The problems we'll find will be the same kinds of problems you'll face in the boiler in your plant. Our first water side component is the steam drum. As you know, steam drums only exist in drum type boilers, but there are similar parts and similar problems with the once through boiler. The outside of the steam drum is insulated and subject to corrosion due to standing water, just like it is in the vents and drains. The potential for corrosion is greater on the inside of the drum than on the outside. Corrosion can seriously weaken the metal. Another problem with the steam drum is that its metal can crack. Now, this is primarily due to the steam drum's construction. The drum's steel walls are very thick. They're exposed to heating and cooling during repeated startups and shutdowns. Cracking from such repeated use is not common if the boiler is operated properly, but the problem potential does exist. Now another problem is corrosive sludge that accumulates inside the drum. Sludge is a product of impurities entering the boiler in the feed water. Corrosion products include rust and in some cases feed water treatment chemicals. Sludge is periodically removed from the boiler during normal operation but there is usually some remaining sludge accumulation which has to be removed before inspection. Besides sludge accumulation the steam drum is also subject to erosion. Now, this erosion is caused by the flow of water in and out of the tubes attached to the drum. If these tubes erode, boiler leaks can result. The steam drum itself has its own internal parts. These present a problem because they can become loose. One internal part that may loosen is the steam screens. Steam screens, or steam scrubbers as they're sometimes called, consist of baffles and screens. Now these are intended to prevent moisture from leaving the drum along with the steam. The steam screens are firmly attached to the inside of the steam drum, but they may come loose and bang around, causing damage. The component in the once through boiler that corresponds to the steam drum in a drum type boiler is called a moisture separator or flash tank. This component may have some of the same problems as the steam drum in a drum type boiler. It is located in the water side flow path. In a once through boiler, most of the water that goes into the water wall is converted to steam in a single pass. The moisture separator, or flash tank, removes any water that has not been turned to steam before the steam goes to the superheater. And when all the water in the boiler is converted to steam before reaching the moisture separator, the component is not always used. This sometimes happens when a boiler is operating at full capacity. The moisture separator is positioned outside the boiler casing and is insulated. Like a steam drum, a moisture separator can become corroded on both its inside and its outside. Also, you may find erosion, cracking, and loose parts. One thing the moisture separator will not have is sludge. Other components common to all water tube boilers are headers. We've mentioned headers before. They have problems very similar to those of steam drums. The inside of the headers suffer from erosion, corrosion, and sludge. There's another problem that is found throughout the boiler, scale formation. Scale is deposits that stick to the insides of any of the components we've discussed. Where it is more severe, where it causes the most problems, is on the inside of the water wall tubes. This is how it happens. Scale first forms inside the water wall. However, the construction of the inside of the water wall tubes normally makes it impossible to see the scale. So the first noticeable scale shows up in other water side components. By then, the water walls may be loaded with it. Scale is formed from impurities which come from two major sources. With the water fed to the boiler,
from the boiler tubes themselves. Many impurities in the water fed to the boiler may form scale as well as sludge on the inside of the hot boiler tubes. Also, part of the material that comes off the boiler tubes because of erosion and corrosion remains in the boiler and forms scale. Scale is a serious problem because it acts like insulation on the inside of the tubes. Take a water wall tube, for example. New tubes have no scale, and the water flowing through them keeps the tubes sufficiently cool. As scale begins to build up inside the tubes, it insulates the inside, and the temperature of the tube metal increases. Since all boilers are built with some allowances for scale buildup, there's no real danger yet. The tube metal is still sufficiently cool. But as the process continues, the scale becomes so thick that the water cannot sufficiently cool the tube. The tube metal eventually fails, causing a rupture. The process we've just seen in a few seconds actually takes place over a period of years. Still, you can't afford to wait for a tube rupture. By the time one tube ruptures, all of the tubes may be ready to go. For now, remember that scale is a problem in the water side components, particularly in the water walls. Well, we've discussed erosion, corrosion, sludge, and scale, all problems related to water side components. That ends our talk on boiler maintenance. Let's uh, break for a few minutes. Read over the material in your text. And if you have any questions about anything you've read or seen, straighten them out with your instructor. <laughs> Thank you.